right? So whatever makes the most advertising dollars is the type of content that these platforms want to put forth, right? That's the type of content that gets ranked the highest. The, the more clickbait there is, the worse the information is, the more advertising dollars uh, these platforms are making, the more incentive there is to produce clickbait, and so on. So what we're trying to do is reverse that relationship between the metrics of the content and the incentives, right? So we want, instead of the incentives driving the metrics, we want to reverse that, put the metrics first, and start ranking information based on what the users found, actually find valuable. Today, Ozan and I are speaking to Slava Balazanov. Slava lives in New York and is an artist and blockchain developer. We will talk about the media and information industry and why relevance in the information economy could be the key to high quality content for the masses. Also, with this episode, we'd like to introduce you to our shorter format. It will be focusing on only one topic and will thus be only around 20 to 30 minutes. Slava, you are a DJ blockchain developer, have worked with this collective and Vogue titles you as a man who lives, breathes and dresses as if you are from the year 2000. Is there <laughs> anything you'd like to add to your introduction? Uh, that about covers that. <laughs> Perfect. Good. So um, let's start right on. One of your projects named Relevant wants to transform the media and information ecosystem. Why that? What's wrong with it from your point of view? Um, well, I think a lot of, you know, it's kind of come to the forefront. A lot of people are realizing that there are a lot of things wrong, mainly the, the underlying business model of all these um, online platforms um, where kind of adverti where advertising money basically trumps um, any, any other kind of use case so basically all these platforms are optimized to make the most uh, the the the, mo the biggest possible amount of money for uh, the people that run the corporations that run these platforms um, make the biggest amount of advertising dollars and of course that comes at the expense of kind of quality of content uh, the types of interactions that these platforms uh, are promoting and Kind of pushing to the forefront um, basically you know basic example is uh, any kind of uh, inflammatory content any any sort of you know uh, content people get angry about is going to get a lot more uh, attention is, is going to get a lot more clicks so platforms are interested in having more of that stuff uh, instead of actually like any kind of like thoughtful, reasonable discussion. Um, so that's kind of the main, the main thing we're trying to solve is how do, how do we re basically redesign uh, this like underlying business model uh, in a way that would actually uh, benefit uh, the quality of an information. So kind of re, uh, rethinking this like underlying structure and, and the incentives, right, the incentive model behind, uh, behind these like con content-based platforms. Could you maybe in your own words um, describe how you're tackling these problems with uh, Relevant? Yeah, totally. <clears throat> so the, the our, kind of our main point, right, so the, the classic structure is Define right so like basically right now what's happening is the the ins the underlying incentive is driving the type of content that's being propagated and promoted right so we can think about it as the structure where kind of the the incentive model starts driving the algorithms and the metrics for content right so whatever makes the most advertising dollars is the type of content that these platforms want to put forth, right, that's the type of content that gets ranked the highest. Um, and then this, th and this basically creates this like, this, um, uh, this vicious cycle, right, so 
the, the more clickbait there is, the worse the information is, the more advertising dollars uh, these platforms are making, the more incentive there is to produce clickbait, and so on. So, so it's continuously more and more clickbait. Uh, kind of this, this in the cycle is just continuing. So what we're trying to do is reverse that relationship between uh, the metrics of the content and the incentives, right? So we want, instead of the incentives driving the metrics, we want to reverse that, right? Put the metrics first and start ranking information based on what uh, the users found, actually find valuable, right? Uh, have, you know, and that's, that's up to the users to define, right? It's, it's uh, kind of separating uh, the platform into communities. So each community basically decides what their values are, what topics they want to focus on, uh, and what kind of information they, they value. And only after that, we have uh, this incentive mechanism that is actually built, uh, kind of rests on top of this uh, metric system. Um, and it acts sort of like a, vaguely it's kind of like a prediction market, right, on what, what type of content gets ranked highly. So the way you can think about it is uh, a good analogy is sports betting. Right, so this, the underlying sport is independent from this economic activity of betting on the sport. Right, so the economic activity, the activity of betting can actually create enough value and create an, a huge economy to potentially even fund the underlying sport. Right, but it should never influence the, the underlying sport, the, the, the activity, you know, the, Activity of the sport should be totally independent, right, and have its own rules for who wins and who loses. That should not be determined by how much money is at stake. Um, of course, that's not always the case. So that's not. That's kind of like the ideal scenario. But at least you know, um, kind of designing the default mode of the system to be, you know, to be that something that produces. Um, a virtuous cycle instead of this like vicious cycle uh, is, that, is what we're trying to accomplish. So basically defining a way to, to rank information uh, based on um, the values of the users, designing an economic system on top of that, and kind of with the hope of creating this virtuous cycle where we can actually fund, start fund, finding a way to fund content that uh, that's valuable and that's that's not um, just determined by numbers of clicks. Um, in my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, Relevant is at its core um, token curated registry. But it's not only governed by, by token only, but um, also high, um, highly with the relevance or authority of the users. Uh, could you... For it's actually... Sorry? Yeah, it's actually not a token curated registry. So it's uh, at the core, there may be eventually a component that's something uh, communities can, uh, can implement and may potentially will, will, will implement as well. The, the default kind of thing we're working on right now is a continuous curation market. Uh, so it's closer to something like Steemit where it's just like a, where we're not, create, we're not curating like a static set of a, a static list. It's more about curating feeds. So it's a continuous uh, feed of information, whether it's um, links or, or, or discussion, uh, but it's happening on a continuous, uh, basically continuous basis. And you uh, earlier said that there is a market that incentivizes user to create content. And the content is kind of rated not only by this market with tokens, but um, there is also a big and important thing called relevance. How do you fit that into your, your system? Yeah, so relevance is, uh, is basically, for us, it's synonymous with reputation. So, it's, um, so the protocol is broken down into two components. One is the reputation component and one is the incentive component. Uh, so basically all of the, the ranking of the information happens via reputation alone. 
Um, so we're, we're very careful. So one thing uh, that's been interesting to observe in both Steemit and other curation markets that um, people have been experimenting with uh, is when you start incentivizing uh, creation of content, all of a sudden that leads to the overall degradation of the quality of the content. Right, because if you're like promising some tokens for like posting, making a post, all of a sudden you have like thousands, millions of people making posts who didn't even want to make a post to begin with. They're just trying to get get some tokens, right? So then you have your you've increased the amount of noise. It's way harder to filter that. It's harder to curate that. Um, and we see that a lot on on Steema, where it's just like lots of lots of kind of garbage content. Um, so we're actually trying to focus the, the incentives on curating content and not creating content. Uh, so basically reducing, you know, taking away the rewards for, for people like making a post, uh, but focusing more on rewarding users for, for, for curating, for like upvoting or downvoting posts. Um, and then the way that works, basically you can earn, um, reputation on the platform by by engaging in a, in a specific community. So reputation is uh, community specific. Each community has their own reputation system. And if you're engaging, so if you're um, commenting up on posts and people upvote your comments, so they, you know, kind of the community thinks your input, uh, your commentary is valuable, your reputation starts to increase. So then you're able to increase your reputation. Um, so at that point, once you have uh, some degree of reputation, when you upvote any post, uh, the ranking of the post increases, right? So it gets bumped up uh, in like the trending list. Uh, if you don't have any reputation, you can still upvote and downvote stuff, but it won't have any impact on the ranking of the post. Uh, so anyone can still stake tokens. Uh, as a prediction on how highly the post will get ranked. Uh, so basically, anyone, right, so anyone can participate in this uh, activity of staking, uh, and it does provide valuable signals, right? So, it's, so it's, it does provide an attention signal where we can still have a list that's, uh, that's ranked by uh, the amount of stake on each post. Uh, but that's not, that's only like, kind of a suggested or like promoted list, uh, kind of the final list uh, for the consumers, the final feed, right, is curated by reputation alone. And the curation rewards are also determined by, uh, by this reputation ranked list. But say you, you know, maybe you don't have any reputation, you're new to the community and you published a great Medium blog and you really want the community to notice your post, you might post it, you might stake then a bunch of tokens on that post with the hope that uh, some users with high reputation will discover it in this, in this uh, token curated feed, right? And then at that point, if they actually do think that um, it's a valuable, valuable content, they'll, they'll upload it and then it'll end up in a, in a reputation curated feed. Uh, so it creates this like stages of, of filtering um, and kind of making, right, so like making that, so there is some relationship between staking and reputation rankings, but still it's, you know, the, the final ranking is decoupled from, um, from this activity of staking. It's a very interesting approach you're going there. Um... A lot of times when I hear about reputation-based systems, it comes at the same time with uh, critique of that this leads to centralization over time. That you have uh, early adopters who are longer in the system and who have a high reputation. And at some point, they have such a big gap that you can't even reach them. If I'm new to the system, how can the metrics attach some relevance to my person? How can I gain uh, authority in that case? So that's actually very, with reputation systems, it's actually much easier to fine tune that um, <clears throat> to support kind of more, more recent uh, activity. 
right? So one way, one easy way to do that is basically have a reputation decay over the course of a couple of months, right? So if you, even if you're joining, you know, maybe you've been in the community for for years and you've been, but you're kind of fall off and you're not as active, your reputation will decrease. And some somebody who's new to the community who is very active, they will be able to gain reputation very, very quickly. Uh, and that's actually a huge uh, point that you mentioned. It's compared to uh, a lot of these like token only uh, constructions, curation markets, right? With tokens, that's a much, much deeper problem where you, you know, the, usually the early users will have you know, a huge amount of tokens to compare to the uh, to the new users, and there's really no great way. There's no really if, there's not an efficient way to redistribute uh, a to redistribute those tokens. B, it's very hard to have like anything resembling a normal distribution of of tokens, right? So that's all these problems that we have with wealth, with money, uh, and so on. With the reputation system, it's much, much, much easier to to do both of those things, right? So to redistribute uh, reputation over time, and also ensure that it's much something more of like a normal distribution where any single person can't just like completely dictate the outcome uh, of the system, right? So it's there's not going to be a person that has like reputation that's a hundred times more than the average user. So then you're really kind of letting the community decide, you know, there's not like this like single person deciding outcomes. The, the you know, community as a whole has a much bigger say. You know, if there is some, you know, if somebody is dete detecting some sort of manipulation, somebody's trying to pump up the post artificially, it's much, much easier for, you know, the community to organize and, and mitigate that kind of activity. But is it... An how i mean i was just i was just um about to ask exactly this question isn't it possible to like create thousands of accounts and upvote my own stories to get some authority so that's impossible because of the way we construct the reputation system so it's actually civil resistant so it's it's based on a it's a page rank uh type algorithm Uh, and basically, the way you make a resistance, you do int introduce some sort of trust into the system. So you do need uh, a set of a set of users that that are trusted by the community, right? So that that's uh, there's like an election process that users can elect them, and those uh, trusted users should have some form of strong identity. Right, so it's up to the community to decide what that is, whether that's like a verified Twitter account, a phone number, or some like more intense like biometric, you know, third-party identity services. Um, so, so that's kind of a variable, and the assumption is that there is a set of users that are trusted, uh, and the way the reputation is computed is basically stems from the trusted users. So. Uh, If I were to say to create a bunch of, you know, like a million spam accounts uh, and all of them upvote this one post, it will be equivalent to me alone upvoting that post, right? Because basically all of my reputation will be redistributed to, to all the spam accounts. They're not going to be able to generate new, basically new reputations from, from within uh, this like subset of the network. Uh, at the same time, there are still attacks that are possible. So like uh, voting rings are still definitely post possible where like a group of users would organize, you know, group of users with some reputation will or all organize and like upload one single post. Um, stuff like that is still possible. Bribery attacks uh, still, of course, is a risk. All of these kinds of things are, are then... We would then rely on the community basically to monitor that activity uh, and have a set of off-chain tools to, to assist with that, uh, to detect any kind of uh, malicious activity. So then basically the community is able to take action. So whether that's just like downvoting the post uh, that's been artificially inflated or going as far as creating a blacklist of accounts to basically zero out the reputation of, 
of any malicious users. Um, so that's that's how we're approaching um, all of these kind of uh, attack risks. Yeah, it's a quite interesting approach. Also, um, I mean, like you mentioned, these uh, the bribery attacks, for example, these are off-chain attacks that you won't be able to mitigate through through the blockchain per se. Um, and interesting how you approach a siblings attack, cyber attacks. Um, I want to ask, like, you want to build a community that's the transformed information economy, and you're building one news feed for all. Because uh, you think the user should not be in the center of the universe, but but the uniform information should be, right? So everyone will see the same feed, and users will be exposed then to a variety of viewpoints and opinions. Um, the feed is then the result of the communal creation, um, but not personal preferences or personalization. Almost every other big information or social network is doing highly personalized feeds. How come you think the total opposite is the right thing? So there's like a slight uh, correct. There's been like slight developments since since that post. So we are actually breaking down. So it's not one single feed anymore. We're kind of breaking down feeds into communities, uh, kind of a, sim similar to subreddits, right? So so we're trying to make this create this focus away from you know, take it away from this like individual personalization. Because I think that's, uh, that's a very tricky and like the, the very bad thing about that is that there is no clear context, right? So once you have a feed that's personalized to you, you're not really sure why it's personalized to you, right? And if you're not sure whether it's like, you know, how does a, you, it, there's no way to compare your feed against somebody else's feed, right? And that's the real problem. You have no vantage point of like being like, oh, well, my feed is different from, the, you know, my friend's feed because so and so and so, right? So what, what we're trying to do is basically create, feed, create feeds for specific communities, right? So, and that gives you, right, so there's still this idea of subjectivity present, right? You can have many different communities with opposing viewpoints, with totally different ideas about the world and so on. So we're kind of embracing this subjectivity and that people are going to disagree at the end of the day about certain things. But what's important there, right, is it gives you a very clear context for, for the view, viewpoints presented in the community or the, the viewpoints and kind of value systems that these feeds are tied to and represent, right? So then as both as a participant, as an outside observer, you can have a very clear understanding of what that context is, why these people are saying what they're saying, and very, a very easy way to compare that against opposing views, right? And then what we're, what we're building also is a way to um, have a very easy way to, to, for users to see uh, when different communities are talking about the same thing, right? So if like two different communities are talking about the same link, they can still see it, everyone's comments basically, right? So you can't, you can like even start upvoting comments from a different community but the ranking, right, will be specific to your community. Like the ranking, you're not going to impact the ranking of this like outside community, which mitigates, mitigates these all these issues that Reddit has, where like, you know, one one community will just like start attacking a different one, start like re, like upvoting or downvoting everything, wreaking havoc. So um, so you can do that. It's impossible to do unrelevant, but you do have this dialogue. Right, opportunity for dialogue, opportunity to like see opposing views and kind of have some constructive discussion uh, with this like very clear context attached. I have to say, one can see that you have put uh, a lot of thought into this project and uh, uh, that you have uh, thought about very different ways how this project can improve our overall uh, you know, life at the end. If I mean, we're all consuming media and information every day. This is actually one of the projects where I'm really, really looking forward to the to the launch. 
you're currently in closed beta. Um, maybe as a last point, could you give our listeners uh, um, what is uh, what are the next steps? What is your current timeline looking like? Yeah, so right now we're working on an open beta, so kind of a new version. Um, so we're doing a lot of, right now we're focusing uh, a lot on product development. We've kind of paused product development for about nine months to really uh, really dig, de dig deep and kind of design the underlying, make sure we have like the underlying protocol designed correctly. And um, so doing a lot of research a lot of writing, a lot of design. So now we're kind of switching gears, focusing on the product, uh, working towards an alpha open beta launch within the next few months. Um, so at that point, really kind of user testing and trying to trying to create something that's kind of open, uh, that's that anyone can start using and playing around with. To start, it's going to be. Uh, a hybrid app with some with a token on Ethereum, so still kind of all the all the computation happening off chain, um, and pe but people being able to earn uh, start being able to earn uh, tokens, and then also kind of along with that experimenting, building out our uh, our blockchain infrastructure. And that's kind of going to be like a similar. So the way we're designing that is kind of interesting. So it's going to be a plasma chain, but it's going to be like a plasma light because we actually don't need users to send tokens to anyone ever. So the plasma chain also doesn't, will never have control of anyone's balance. So that makes it really, really easy. All the plasma chain does is basically do the reputation calculation and then allocate inflationary rewards. So inflationary rewards are also, so new tokens are minted on the Ethereum chain also. So Plasma chain doesn't have the right to just like mint tokens arbitrarily. So the only thing it does is allocate every block or every like whatever the time period, maybe like every hour, it basically says who the, re who the current uh, rewards should go to. So basically we're trying minimizing the risk and you know, the, the risk of money at stake at, you know, at any given point. Um, and then users can basically decide. So the biggest risk, the, the worst that Plasma can do, uh, you know, the Plasma validators, right? They can, the worst that they can possibly do is just like start giving themselves all the rewards. Um, and that's, you know, those are small amounts compared, you know, there's not like a lot of money at risk at any given point. And users are basically able to watch that. If all of a sudden I'm not getting the rewards that I think I deserve, you know, I elect new validators or switch or sell my token, whatever it is. Um, and then I can mitigate, you know, and each user can basically decide how much risk, whenever, when do I withdraw and just like transfer the, the, the balance in the reward pool to my own account. Um, so that's kind of the, the blockchain infrastructure that we're working on. Um, yeah, I mean, hopefully within the next couple of months, we'll have an open beta for everyone to try out. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you very much, Slava. Oh, yeah. I think that sounds pretty much up. Slava, the DJ, the developer, the man and the thinker. <laughs> Great. Thanks, guys. Oh, Thank yeah, you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to help others to find us, leave us a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks a lot.